I'm Joyce Chaka with The Village. I uh, arrange The Village Talks. And um, we thank the Senior Center for providing our location uh, the third Wednesday of every month from uh, 12 until 1 or shortly after that. Our March speaker is going to be artist Alan Bull talking about his art. Our April speaker is Jack Santos uh, about the clock towers in Newburyport. So those are two wonderful programs that are coming up. And they go beyond that, but I'll leave you just with the, those two to think about. Um, we know there have been problems with the sound in, in the, the room here, and we're really trying to address it as much as possible. During uh, the q and if you, if you have a question, raise your hand, and one of us will come to you with a handheld mic. In order to use the mic effectively, you're going to have to hold it directly under your mouth, which doesn't seem to be picking up at all, <laughs> even though it's on. But you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, if the mic does, if the mics don't work, then just try to speak as clearly and loudly as possible. And our speaker may have to repeat the question. Uh, so we hope that you know you will be able to hear the questions. Um, that are asked. Um, if you have a cell phone, you must turn off your cell phone. If you do not know how to turn off your cell phone, you must find somebody near you who can help you with it because the cell phones do interfere with the, the audio. Did I forget anything? I forgot something. Oh, you forgot something. Yeah, there yeah. you go. My, apolo <laughs> my apologies. Kelly has brought uh, 30 copies of her book, and she has graciously offered to hand them out free to people here uh, in the room, uh, one per family. So if you're interested in that after the presentation, um, come get a book. Thank you. And I forgot something, too, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn the program over to Allison from Avita, and Allison will be introducing the speaker. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Allison Rice from Avita of Newburyport, a memory care community just down the street on the campus of Anna Jakes Hospital. And we're so happy to be here in this gorgeous room um, and our first experience with Village Talk, so this is great. So I'm very pleased to have Kelly McCarthy, who's from our home office, so she um, heads up our engagement and memory care services, and um, she does a lot of wonderful trainings for our staff, um, including we've got a support group that she has attended and um, offers a lot of great information. So we want to share her with you today. And we also have Kathy Codwick, our program director, who uh, heads up our all the fun activities and, um, you know, the great things we do every day with our residents at Avita. So, uh, Kelly and Kathy. Excellent, thank you. I have three older brothers, so I don't think I'm gonna need this, all right? But for the recording, we're gonna use this. Um, uh, so, and again, if you have any questions, I'll repeat it, and I'm pretty loud, so if you can't hear me, I'll walk around. Don't worry about a thing. And the other thing that you guys are really lucky about is I only pick on the people in the front row. <laughs> I took a shower, but that's okay. Again, I like to walk around. It's really important to me, so I hope that you enjoy this program. So I did. I wrote a book. Uh, a lot of people about in 2015, as I was traveling throughout the country, would say, Kelly, you need to write a book. And uh, it was the furthest thing from my mind. But one of the things I kept hearing everywhere I went, you can click that next slide, because um, everything I kept hearing where I went, they'd say, boy, you need to write a book. The story that I, people share in one part of the country, I heard in another part of the country. And if it was on Facebook, it must be true, right? So this is, these are some of the posts I tagged myself because I wanted to see where I went. For the majority of these, except for those ones in the Caribbean, uh, this was work related. So I traveled all over the country and I learned to be not only a teacher, but a student. And so what was happening in, happening in Walla Walla, Washington with family members or caregivers, I noticed was happening in Jacksonville, Florida. And in, in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, things were happening right here in Massachusetts. So I started 
taking these stories and utilizing them to spread the knowledge that I learned from frontline associates in places like Avita of Newburyport and also the uh, family members that were having challenges. So we're going to talk about um, the first four chapters of my book because these have to do with the methodologies that I created to help our frontline support and our family members care for people in this journey. So, can you hit return? There we go. Reaching for the Brass Ring. So the name of the book is called Reaching for the Brass Ring. Anybody ever do this before? Raise your hand. Just got a few. Okay, so, why, um, so what did you do when you reached for the brass ring? What did you get? If you didn't catch it, you got nothing. But how about if you got it? What did you get? All right, so let's do it this way. So you, a lot of you raised your hand. Now I want to know, and you have to be honest with me here. Got to be honest. We're on camera. How many of you have played this game, raise your hand? Not one as a child? All right, we got one. All right, so I'm going to ask her the, the next question. All right, she has to be truthful. Did you get the brass ring? I did get the brass ring. And look at the smile on her face. <laughs> what did you get? A free ride. A free ride on the merry-go-round. So prior to COVID, that, that's what life is all about now, right? Prior to COVID. Uh, prior to COVID, um, there were 11 merry-go-rounds in the United States still active. And so as a five-year-old kid, um, you get on that merry-go-round and you want that outside horse. And you want to reach for that brass ring. There's only one brass ring in a two-minute ride. The rest are all silver. They throw those away, right? It's tough to get the brass ring. It's an achievement. And when you get it, you get a smile on your face that lasts a long time, right? But if you don't get it, guess what? The sun still comes up the next day. And so the reason why I wrote this book and I call it, I call it Brass Ring Memoirs, it's about we don't always get it right in memory care. It is not easy in memory care. But the sun still comes up the next day. And some days it's going to work, whatever that magic saying that is or whatever you do is someday it's going to work and some days it's not and you got to we got to be okay with that right so reaching for the brass ring reaching for goals that's what i talk to the frontline teams about i talk about how how we have goals too right our goals like the goal of village talk uh the village is a village talk right um that goal is to help seniors right in our town and that's the goal they reach for and they get that goal but he's, he mentioned earlier today that he'd like to have more he'd like to do more that's another goal and so we reach for these all our lives we get them we don't and we move on and so that's why I call it reaching for the brass ring and so I'll give you a scenario that I'm sure you all if you ever have ever cared for somebody with memory loss um, is that uh, you know how sometimes it's hard to give someone a shower with memory loss do you want to take a shower? What do they say? They know tomorrow. They, they might say, I already took one. Or, or my favorite is, I didn't do anything to get dirty, right? <laughs> so, so what happens is, oftentimes we as caregivers are so white knuckled. And we're like, we are the person who knows better. This person needs to take a shower. And you're so white knuckled on getting them in the shower that we may say things and do things right that may question that dignity right and the respect you need to take a shower you stink come on get in here you just forgot again don't you remember you have alzheimer's right don't you remember you just forgot again these are some of the things that we say people say in frustration because we're so white knuckled thinking we are in charge and i get that but what's really important is about this brass ring. I had two. One for the caregiver and one for the person you're caring for. Don't ever forget that there's one here. Our goal is to get these two together. I'm going to tell you something. Promise not to tell anybody. <laughs> I brush my teeth in the shower. I've done it for years. 
Don't judge me, just know that about me. Because when I'm 85 years old and I forget, what might you do to get these brass rings together instead of saying, do you want to take a shower? Yeah, yeah hey, how about brushing your teeth here, here, Kel? Right? So it's about knowing the habits and routines that may not be socially acceptable. I'm sure that some of you in here have um, habits that may not be socially acceptable, right? They're no, no, they're no different than we are. But I do want you to know one thing, and that is when it comes to brass rings and being a caregiver for somebody with memory loss, it is so important not to forget theirs. It is so important that when somebody says, I don't want to take a shower and you can't, you don't know if they brushed your teeth, you don't know, but it's not working, they keep saying no, guess what I want you to do? Drop your brass ring. Don't be so white knuckled and have to, or you have to take one. They don't have to do anything. The first thing we have to do is love them and make sure that they're calm and that you find ways to connect with them. So I'll give you my next chapter. One Savannah, all right. Peacock moments. So we're gonna talk about discovery in a moment, but the next thing is when somebody says, no, I don't want to, or they say something like, what time is supper? Has anybody ever heard that, what time is supper? And then, it, why are you laughing? Everyone's heard Yeah, yeah. And then, and then a few seconds later, what time is supper? Right? So one of the things I want to do is make sure that I instill in you to create peacock moments. How do you think that peacock feels? Proud. How else do you think that peacock feels? Beautiful. Beautiful. Does a peacock just stand there? Okay, if you want your cameras out, you're going to have to do it now. Here we go. It struts. What do you need to strut? What do you need to strut besides a glass of wine? <laughs> Say confidence. I will tell you whether I'm here with three people or I'm here with 300, those three descriptive words come to mind pride, beauty, and confidence. And oftentimes with this disease, people are robbed of their pride. They're robbed of their beauty, and they're robbed of their confidence. Because when you hear what time is supper all the time, you end up reacting or responding like you heard it a hundred times. I told you already, it's five o'clock. It's five o'clock. Oh, silly. Just stay here, I'll come get you when it's time. Are those peacock moments? No, they're not. And so it's so imperative that we, and sometimes we get, you know, and I get it, when we get off the top, we get so angry, it might be a reflective thing that we say, wait a minute, that didn't go as planned. Did I create a peacock moment? Did I create pride, beauty, and confidence in the person that I'm caring for? If your answer is no, don't beat yourself up. Just know that it was, you didn't do it, now let's go back, right? When things are calm and do it again and create pride, beauty, and confidence. So when you go into somebody's room and you say, good morning, how was your night? And they look at you and they say, it was terrible, there's a leak in my ceiling and my bed is all wet. And they really just wet the bed. When that happens, you tell them, I'm so sorry, let's get that fixed. Come on, let's get you washed up. It's called a fiblet, a therapeutic lie that decreases anxiety. Some people don't like to do it because they say, I can't lie to my mother, I can't lie. I'm a Christian and I think if I'm going to hell, it's not because I created a fiblet. Because it's a therapeutic lie that decreases anxiety. It's for the right reason. Because what I'm doing is I'm getting into their reality. I'm getting into their space. I'm loving them where they are. I'm creating pride, beauty, and confidence. It's not always gonna look good. It's not always gonna look good. But it's important. It's important to do. Anybody have any questions so far? Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. See, I told you, three older brothers. I gotta thank them when I get home today. All right. Oh, so you know what? You don't have to go back. But I want you to know two things I tell my teams about peacock moments. 
The first thing is give them out as many times as you can. So when you see somebody and they have a beautiful sweater on, you have a beautiful sweater. Own it, mean it. If you, hear, if you see that somebody got their hair done, tell them they look wonderful. If there's a gentleman with a, a, um, a military hat and you know that they served, thank you for your service. All of these things are peacock moments. They're easy, they're giveaways. But when somebody looks at you and says, you're an awesome daughter, you're doing a great job. When people look at you and say, you're a wonderful husband, I know this isn't always easy. Soak it up like vitamin D. Soak it up. You're not always gonna get it right. And I'm sure you beat yourself up like many people do that are caregivers. But you're great and you're wonderful. And each day you're gonna reach for brass rings and you're gonna get some and you're gonna drop some, right? And as long as you're reflective on the things that you do, creating peacock moments, pride, beauty, and confidence, you're doing the right thing. Now the next thing is, again, I brush my teeth in the shower. Look beneath the surface. Let not the several quality of a thing nor its worth escape thee. 10% of who I am is on top. You see it. You see what? I got glasses. I like to eat. I got hair that I dye that is about tan, uh, blonde, kind of brown, right? You got all this stuff. You know that I'm loud. You, you kind of sense my personality. But you don't know what's underneath my iceberg. My two beautiful children. I live with my mom and dad at the age of 90, uh, 89, right? That I'm divorced times three. I got it right this time, don't worry. <laughs> but all these things you don't know until I go underneath the iceberg. Well, let me tell you, if you ever need somebody to support your loved ones that have memory loss, don't be afraid to share the good. Don't be afraid to share the bad. And don't be afraid to share what you might think is the ugly. Because the more successful you, you, the more you share your loved one or the person that you're caring for, the more you share that information, the more successful they're going to be, right? Places like uh, uh, Vita of Newburyport and our other communities, we've done this a long time. It's not our first rodeo. But it doesn't mean we know everything. We need you. We are great at what we do because we make sure that you're involved in the process. Because we don't know who brushes their teeth in the shower. We don't know what kind of shampoo they use. We want to know if they say, I want to go home, what is home? Because we want it to be our home. We want to be able to do and know what they feel. And it's important to really have that collaborative relationship. All right. So, I love these slides. I threw this in. It's not in my book, but it's wonderful. And it's, uh, if you ever need this as a reference, go on Google search engine and put amygdala um, bookshelf. So this is the amygdala bookshelf. Um, and this is the hippocampus. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this before, but if you ever have to do any kind of education for memory care, I would say print this paper out and share it because it's absolutely fantastic. So search engine amygdala bookshelf. This, this is a bookshelf, it's a healthy brain. On the left side, or yeah, my left side, is um, a hippocampus, the hippocampus, which controls and supports logic, fact, and reasoning. On the other side is the amygdala. It's an almond shape, there's two of them, almond shape underneath um, the hippocampus or underneath the brain stem, and this controls and supports, it's in the limbic system, emotions, right? And so it's really important to know that that part of the brain doesn't deteriorate like the hippocampus. And it's so important because this to me and our teams is a game changer as the disease progresses. All right, so healthy brain, three pounds. You can hit that. Here is early stage memory loss. This is where in old age, we start to see signs, right? And so again, perfect example, what time is supper? Perfect example. So again, when we look at them and we say, I told you already, it's five o'clock, we have to understand, well, wait a minute, that's not a peacock moment. What else could we say to them? Are they hungry? Say, hey, listen, are you hungry? I know where the, you know, I, I know where the kitchen is. Or maybe they're bored. Maybe it's, hey, you know what? It's, it's gonna be in about 35 minutes. Let's go for a walk, we've got some time, right? So it's all those things that we have to determine. But again, if we said to them, you forgot again, how do you think that makes them feel? Anybody? 
Lousy. Anybody else? What? Feeling low. Frustrated, I heard. Yeah. All right, next. Mid-stage memory loss. This is where somebody is really in the middle stage where they may forget people and things. If you look here, the, you've got the left side that has childhood, teenage years, uh, middle age, uh, I'm sorry, adulthood, middle age, and old age. So if you look, all that bottom shelf is all the things that happened to us in our youth. So if you think about the hippocampus, that might be the learning, right? When mom said, hey, oh, you said to your, your mom, hey, I can count to five, one, three, five. And she says, oh, you missed a few. One, two, three, four, five, it's the learning, right? And then on the other side, the, the hippo, this is where the, the amygdala is. This is the fun stuff. And I often think about Halloween as fun for me. It may not be fun for you. This is also the scary stuff. If anything happened in your youth that was fearful. So think about the person you're caring for and what was that experience like? What was happy? What could have been sad? Right? So me, it was Halloween. It was always fun for me. Those big candy bars you remember, right? <laughs> yeah, they don't do that anymore. Um, so again, just that. And then if you look at this middle stage, this is where somebody starts not only forgetting all of, this, all of the things that happened in their senior years, but maybe in their middle years too. Let's say, let's give an example. Let's say a woman finds, uh, she's in a neighborhood, she, she sees this boy and they're friends, best friends. All of a sudden in teen year, teenage years, they start dating. At the age of 18, they get married. Right? And then they have kids, so now you're looking at the other side where they, have, they, have ki they get married, they have kids, um, you know, the fun things or the challenging things that might happen, all that stuff that comes with having kids in their life. And on the left-hand side is maybe purchasing a house, right? uh, having an income, maybe a profession, uh, maybe a homemaker, all that stuff that they do, logic, fact, and reasoning. Now you can see that they're starting, that person, that that woman is starting to forget. And guess what? Her husband died at the age of 80, let's say 85. Does she remember his death? If you notice on here, all the books are off the shelf. So this is a person who can't remember short-term memory loss. Anything that you say to them, it doesn't, it doesn't hold on. In my book, I talk about an 18-wheeler, first in, last out. So the things that are coming on board at this stage really can't grasp, they really can't stay in their, this person's memory. So this person here doesn't remember her husband died at the age of 85, but remembers that she married him, remembers that they were friends, remembers all the fun things that they had on the, on the, uh, on the amygdala side. And she looks at you and says, where's my husband? Do you know where my husband is? Do you know where my husband is? Have you ever heard that? What do you do? Because when you say to them, Ma, Dad died, don't you remember? How would she feel? Devastated. Devastated. Now listen, I'm not opposed to if a person passes, the, the bottom line is talk to family, work as a family unit, work with your team, meaning if you have the Alzheimer's Association or any type of organization that supports you, ask that question, you know, do I tell them whether their loved one passed? Um, like taxes, death is pretty, you know, uh, concrete. So I tend to err and say on a small scale, you, they can mourn the loss of their loved one. You can celebrate the person's uh, life. Uh, you know, go out to dinner like we do when we talk about the person, but then take the prayer cards and put them away. Take the cards and put them away. Don't put them in the walker where that person may experience it again for the first time. Because if you do, how do they feel? Devastated. Or they could be angry. Who the heck are you? I had breakfast with my husband today, right? So there's a lot of emotions. They can feel angry. They can feel, mad. They can feel sad, depressed, frustrated. All of that, devastated all over again. So it's really important to, to understand that. Now look at this again, and this is end stage memory loss, but I want you to take a look at that amygdala side. There are still books on that shelf, right? Those shelves still have books on them. They have lost some of the amygdala, but the, but the feeling, right? That limbic, limbic system, the emotions are still there. 
So now end stage memory loss, and this is where I kind of talk to our associates or family members. If you have a loved one and maybe they're in bed a lot and you go in and you check on them, but you don't talk to them, this shows you that they can still feel lonely, that they can still feel sad, that they can still feel isolated. When you go into a room and you consider that person now a task, and you go in and you change a brief or you wash them without saying much of anything, they can still feel violated. They can still feel scared, right? And so it's so important that when you go into a person's room in stage memory loss, that you still communicate with them. Sometimes music is the most wonderful thing that we can still offer someone, especially a song that maybe they once sang to you, right? That's where the amygdala kicks in, even at end stage memory loss. So when you go into that room and you say, hi, you know, again, you can use my name, hi Kelly, it's me. And you go in there and instead of not acknowledging them, you might sing the song that they once sang to you. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. She can still feel love. She can still feel safe. And one of the most important things, she can still feel like she belongs, right? So important, and that's why I love this slide deck because it really instills in us that as we communicate, and sometimes it's hard, people say, well, what do I do when I visit mom? Sing the song that she once sang to you. Sing the song to your husband that you dance to, right? It's so important to connect in that way. That amygdala is still alive. Any questions? Why self-care first? So let me tell you, so this, again, I, I did this strategically backwards. So this is my first chapter, is taking care of yourself. Now I left it here because we're, we only did an hour. I actually do, 30 minutes actually. So I only do, um, when I do an eight hour class for, my, for the associates in our communities, I start with this one first. In my book, you'll see this is chapter one. Because in a lot of trainings that you see with memory care, you often see that one where? Where do you see self-care in a big training? What the heck? We're exhausted by then. What do you mean putting us last? Right? So like I said, I traveled for a living. Most weeks I, got, I was in an airport by you know, 7 in the morning on Monday, and I would come home either Wednesday or Thursday. And I remember the attendants used to say, put your own mask on first before attending others. And that's when I was like, wow, hey, wait a minute, I could use that. And so I always paid attention. And I was in multiple planes every week. And I always paid attention when they said that. I always looked up and made sure I checked in with myself. Take care of yourself first because you will be no good to the person you're caring for if you don't, right? So this is a slide right out of my, uh, my program and so you can kind of hit it again. What if every day you felt emotionally strained? I mean, COVID did this a lot to our frontline associates, right? It was, um, they were so dedicated. If you saw these uh, communities and hospitals that said heroes, we really meant it, right? It was so, uh, so hard for them. But overwhelmed working too many hours on your feet, didn't have enough time to eat right, felt the need to continually um, correct someone. So during COVID, we identified videos and Zoom, right? We all did Zoom to make sure that we were still touching our frontline associates for education and support. It was so important to do. And so same thing with you all. Make sure you take care of yourself and that you eat right. Those are the main things that we think about. Me eating right, sleeping right, um, and, and the like. But how about those hobbies that you may have that's independent of somebody else? Anybody want to share a hobby? The only thing it has to um, meet my criteria is it has to be legal in all 50 states. <laughs> Anyone? What's a hobby? Yeah. Stamp collecting. Stamp collecting. Perfect. Quilting. I love that. I'm a lefty. Could you try? Teach me? No. I know. Glue gun. That's all I got. Who else? Knitting. 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 Wonderful. Hey, I can hook you two up. 
Good. <laughs> Excellent. And so these are so important. If you have one that you think about that you did a long time ago, get back to it. Get back to it. Fill yourself up. Do those things that are important to you. Because caregiving is not easy. It is not easy. So here's an oath. And, and there are many oaths if you Google caregiver's oath. I figured, well, I'm writing a book. I might as well make my own oath. Uh, so thinking about all the experiences that I've had, I kind of strung together some, together some things that I heard family members and frontline associates say. So the first thing is, and you guys can help me by reading along, that would be wonderful. One is, I will say yes when somebody offers help. Why sometimes do we not do that, right? So he says, do you need any help? What do you say? Look at her, she's already, no. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm the daughter, three older brothers, I said. Guess who takes care of the parents? Yeah, right? And, and I had a hard time with my brothers. I still have a hard time, but I've got one who took, took a plane up here and now he lives with us and he's the sole caregiver uh, personally for my dad, driving him around, doing things, and I support my mom. But it took a long time for me to say yes. I didn't want to say yes. I don't know why. It was like I was programmed. I'm the baby. I'm supposed to do this, right? And, and so please um, ask for help if you need it. And again, this wonderful service here and many others, uh, the Alzheimer's Association and the like. I will forgive myself when I don't get it right, right? Some days you'll be like, wow, this was great. And the other day is like, oh man, right? It can be a roller coaster. So forgive yourself. Identify, was it a peacock moment, wasn't it? I will reach for my brass ring and do the best to reach for the brass ring of the person I'm caring for. Get to know them. What are their routines and habits? What do they like, right? Think about how many pillows you sleep with. And think about if you got the worst pillow in the world, opposite of what you sleep with right now. How would your first night's sleep be? Right? So those things are so important. And we go that deep when we have people come into our communities because it's about knowing what their favorite things are, what their shampoos are and conditioners and all of that stuff. I will live in the moment yet plan for the future. That's huge. My mother went for elective hip surgery. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna take a couple weeks off. When, you get, uh, when you're done with the surgery, I'll come home and take care of you as you recoup. Well, guess what? She got an infection. And I had three days to determine what sniff she was to go into, sniff, skilled nursing facility. I was mortified. She didn't have to go, I'll do it. No, you can't, right? And so I, at that point, realized that listen, I have a plan for my folks, but I also need to plan for the future, right? So live in the moment, yet plan for the future, whatever that looks like, because it may change. I will find moments in the day to self-reflect and not feel selfish in the process, in the meanwhile. So again, those things that you like to do, uh, think about the day, how did it go, but also take time out and, and process, hey, did I do what I needed to do today to take care of myself? So important. Next, I will pay attention to my health and follow up with challenges right away. Don't cancel appointments because you blink and then it becomes a year later, right? I never cancel a doctor's appointments. I only postpone them. <laughs> I, no, I'm telling you, it works. If you cancel appointments, you blink and then th four months later, you're like, oh man, I got to go back. I got to make that appointment. I never cancel appointments. I only postpone them to another date. <laughs> so then I get there eventually. But it's important, whatever works for you. I will provide and accept peacock moments which create what? Absolutely. I will laugh appropriately in public and give myself permission to laugh in private, maintaining the dignity and the respect of the person I'm caring for. What does that look like? Another book out there I really like, it's called Kisses for Elizabeth. It was written by Stephanie Zeman. And, uh, old school nurse, and I talked to her once, and just wonderful, wonderful woman. And she, talks, she talked just about that. She talked about making sure that you, the person's safe, but making sure you laugh when it's funny, but making sure that you laugh in private if it's, if it's not funny to that person. Now, you're not gonna laugh at them. It might just be the situation. So I'll give you an example. I had a woman once, and I looked at her, I said, you have the most beautiful eyes. 
And she looked at me and she said, I wouldn't know, I stand behind them. <laughs> oh my gosh, how profound was that? Unbelievable. And so there are things that people say that can be very funny and they may not think it's funny at the time. So again, give yourself permission to laugh because sometimes you hear funny things, right? It's important. Um, I will respectfully share what is under my per the person's iceberg to support the caregivers who are helping me. Again, if you know something about someone, share it. Because you can't do this alone. And if you're doing it alone, again, it's, it's so much stress to you as one caregiver. I will draw strength to, to, for what I believe. I, uh, let me repeat that. I will draw strength from what I believe to be my belief system, right? Deem my belief system. So regardless what religion you are, what faith, or if you believe in nature and Zen, make sure you go to that space when you're not doing well. Find strength in what you believe in, regardless whether it's a religion, a faith, or nature. It's so important to get there. And that's it for the first four chapters. I have other chapters in my book on communication, uh, behaviors. I use that term loosely. They're neither good or bad. It could be, again, I have a behavior. I brush my teeth in the shower. Um, but I also have one on sex. Um, there's one on I want to go home, right? Because one of the things as I was printing the book and it was getting published, I had to stop the presses and I added chapter nine, which is I want to go home. I've heard that in every state. And, and not just in communities, but actually people telling me that when they're home with their loved one, they're saying I want to go home. So we talk about home isn't necessarily a place. It's a feeling, right? And so identifying that feeling is so important when you're caring for somebody with memory loss. So I want to thank you so much. I'm happy to um, sign the books if you'd like. We can do that in a little bit. But what I wanted to do now is pass over with Kathy. Kathy's going to talk about a program that we do in our communities called Join My Journey. And the Join My Journey experience is an experience that is a virtual dementia experience. So we all age. I mean, there are times when I wake up in the morning and I gotta stop moving before I move, right? Because I'm stiff. Uh, at the age of 40, I woke up and I couldn't see my feet without glasses on. We all have that, right? And then the hearing goes. So we all have these natural aging things that occur. But this experience now, what we do is we throw in memory loss. And we talk to people about, if you are a direct caregiver, I want you to experience all of that right, that comes with aging, and then let's add memory loss on top of it. And it's just that experience to help you understand that when you're going with somebody, to be clear in direction and to really, your approach is, is very, very important. So great. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I'm going to invite anybody up here that wants to do this. It's a virtual dementia experience. Uh, dementia affects all of your senses, your sense of sight, your sense of touch, your sense of smell. Um, and I would like to invite somebody up here that would like to experience it. And this is something we do as part of our training for new employees so they can know what it's like um, in, to live in the world of our residents. And I've also offered this as part of our family support group for families to experience too. So would anybody like to come up and participate? Isn't that great? Come on up, come on up. <laughs> So what, what's your name? Steve. So St what Steve's gonna do, thank you so much for being the, um, the, the victim, I mean the. <laughs> um, so what she's gonna do is she's gonna compromise her, his senses. So the first thing that's gonna happen, she's got uh, beans. And so we either use beans or we actually have um, cooking mats that are the, the triangle cooking mats that make it very hard to uh, put in your shoe. And when you do, what do you think you feel? bumps, right? So if you think about neuropathy, right? You think about pins and needles in our feet. You think about um, the challenges we have with arthritis. 65% of individuals over the age of uh, 85 have some form of arthritis. So uh, this simulates that feeling of having arthritis. So we're asking him to throw some, yeah, don't you worry. Just throw them right in there. Don't worry about the number and counting. 
Just go right in, right in there. The more the merrier. Yeah, there you go, now he's got it. Okay, he's uncomfortable. You might even want to throw some more in there if you, there you go. Perfect, so this again, you think about standing all day long with something like this, right? So we'll have him put those on. Thank you very much. No. Yeah, and so this is all dementia friendly too, so thank you, I'm glad you mentioned that. So all of these products, they'll either be uh, washed, those will be thrown out, but there's some, the headsets and stuff are white. We have the antiseptic wipes as well. So we'll have him get up in a little bit, but before we do, we're gonna have him wear the gloves. So notice the color of these gloves. What color are they? Have you ever watched the movie Still Alice? Or read the book? So the color black looks like a hole. I'm gonna age myself right now. I remember the Looney Tunes where they threw the black um, mat, a black hole, they threw it down and then Bugs Bunny jumped in it. Because perceptually black looks like a hole. So it's a dark color. We actually put these on him. You can continue to go on. And because um, it, there, it's a dark color, he, we're gonna be asking him to go into a black bag. So it's gonna be really hard. And oh, wait a minute, these are silk gloves. What does that do? It makes them slippery. She's also putting rubber bands on him. This is an example of arthritis, right, and neuropathy. Oftentimes, and my mother has this, where she'll drop things, she'll tend to go to a counter and she slides things off versus pick them up because she has numbness in her fingers. So this is what this example is gonna be on top of, right, what he has right now. So the next thing that she's, he has is glasses, right? So if anybody here has ever had corrective surgery, maybe because you've had cataracts, right? And so this, um, we painted the inside yellow and we have purple dots. And these things can be anything like floaters, it can be diabetic retinopathy, it can be, um, it can be cataracts and the like. So this is where vision is impaired. We know that with Alzheimer's, oftentimes peripherally, they have a hard time. So that's why when you're, when you're connecting with somebody, you, you never want to come from behind because most likely you'll get a smack or they'll be startled, right? Because I would too. And even if I'm on the side, he may not see me if he's looking forward. Always come from the front, give eye contact. Now, if I stand in front of him like this and he doesn't like me, maybe he doesn't like the way I smell, maybe he doesn't like the way I talk or whatever, what can he do with, to me? He can push me right away. So I always like to, number one, get down, and I like to come off to the side a little bit. So I'm still in front of him, but if he doesn't like me, guess what? He can get up and walk away. So that's just a cue for that. The front on is also kind of threatening. Yep, absolutely. Look at you all geared up. You look great. Also, 75% of people over 65 have some type of visual impairment. Yep. Nasal. So this is my favorite, and it can be the hardest, right, to endure. So if, if you notice, your brain requires about 25% of the oxygen you take in on a daily basis, and we don't even think about it. The things we do every day, it, our brain takes about 25% of the oxygen you take in. Now, when there's a crisis, like either a car accident or something that startles you, automatically your brain requires... 50% of your oxygen. And it doesn't ask for it, it just takes it. Has anybody had a headache sometimes when they're either maybe doing something and uh, you get uh, a car in front of you stops quick? I get them, I get headaches, right? A tension headache. I get them when I'm tense, and that's why they call them tension headaches. And so what that is, is my, my brain's response to, hey, I need that 50%. I need that 50%. So if you think about a person with memory loss or anybody, a senior, that has a crisis situation and they're anxious, we really wanna make sure that we instill deep breathing because that's gonna help them get the percentage that that brain needs at that moment. So I'm gonna ask you guys on the count of three to take a deep breath. I want you to go in with your nose. We're gonna hold it and then we're gonna go out. With, and you can go out with your mouth. Ready, one, two, three. Do that again. If I can give you any advice today, that's to do that multiple times throughout the day. 
before you get up, maybe at any chair that you're on, do that, um, anything, because that is so important for you. You're giving your brain what it needs, which is the oxygen that it demands, especially in a crisis situation. All right, so now she's got the headset. The headset not only is noise cancelling, meaning they won't hear too much of what's going on. He looks great, doesn't he? <laughs> but he also is listening to background noises. Who goes to a restaurant and hears people with dishes, clanging, talking, phones ringing, right? It happens to all of us. So now with all that stuff, he's going to be listening to that. What, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop talking. Kathy is going to, after that's over, she's going to give him th three or four... Uh, things to do, tasks to do inside that bag. So we're going to watch him do it. We're going to watch Kathy's response. Is she going to be nice? Is she going to be that nice care caregiver? Or is she going to say, hey, hurry up. Come on, we got to go, right? So we're gonna, I want you to kind of be that participant, that passive participant that watches both situ scenarios. So if, if, if it at all experiences becomes overwhelming, that's all he has to do is put his hand up and she'll stop the simulation. Camera's out. This is good.
Yeah. Not able to function, helpless. How about you in the audience? Did you, anything in particular you want to share? What you saw? What Kathy did? What she could have done better? What could have Kathy have done better? There was a lot, but <laughs> she did that on purpose. Patience. Oh, I'll tell you, if that was me, I would have been, you know, I, I would have been pushing down and saying, I'll do that for you. Never mind. We're going to be late. Right? Kindness. Could have been a little more kindness. I don't know about you, but my heart ripped out when he said, oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't here. Right? But some people... Go ahead. Nonverbal cues. Nonverbal cues. I could have helped him. Yeah. You know, but you did, you know, two minutes into it. Yeah, she did, right? And how about the, how about, um, the, the, the level of her voice? I need a tissue. Right? Soft spoken. She didn't speak up. And, I got a little curt. and she got a little curt. Never mind. Never mind. Right? Never mind. Is that a peacock moment? No. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. <laughs> what? Yeah, you can have the beans. You can have. Does anybody have any questions? I'm, I can pass out the books. Anybody have any questions about? What Kathy and I did, yes? Not so much about what you did, but what are techniques when someone has the same question over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. Where's the cat? Mm -hmm. Where's my cat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would all depend on their cognitive level. So when somebody asks me a particular question about that, there's so much more we need to know about, right? So did she have a cat? Does she have a cat? How long has the cat been missing? Does she look at um, stuffed animals as cats? Um, you know, so I'd have to ask a lot more questions about that. But in my book, there was a woman who kept saying, is this the old, uh, is this the old carriage house? I, I use the word carriage house. It was actually another name to protect the, the innocent. Uh, but she says, is this the old carriage house? And she kept saying that. And it was to the point that people would say, yeah, I told you already, it's the old carriage house, right? So they'd, they'd end up, because of her repeats and constantly repeating, what I ended up doing was learning about why she was thinking this was the old carriage house. And guess what? Incidentally, it was. It was a restaurant, and it turned into this assisted living. So she wasn't telling me that she forgot she was telling me, I remember, is this the old carriage house? So I was able to create a story around that that really helped her. Now, with regards to the cat, again, I would, I'd want to find out more about the information. So understanding that, you know, is she someone who is looking for nurture? She's looking for a cat, and she's cognitively declined to identify whether it's real or not. So I'm a, a big proponent of um, for real kitties. Um, that are wonderful and that uh, lifelike and that create that nurturing uh, re uh, um, responsibility. Now, the other thing is cats uh, elude us, right? I don't know how many times I have two cats and I don't know where the heck they are in the house. So, you know, the other thing you can say is, you know what, those darn cats, I think one of them was under the couch um, or you never know where they are. I, well, I want you to know one thing, though, I did feed them today, right? Because that's scary. I did feed them today. They're okay. So those are some of the things that you might do. But again, I don't know the person, so I wouldn't know exactly what to say. Work with the team. Yes? Are there exercises or games that can be used to stimulate someone's recall of how to do something or how to perform a, a behavior? So I always think about amygdala. So I, you know, even with somebody with aphasia who can't speak or formulate language, music is wonderful for that. But with regards to uh, when they're already diagnosed and they are on their journey of this disease, um, there's not a lot of things that you can do in terms of elevating to the point that you're going to get them back to where they were. But yes, there are things that you can do stimulating them that can really help them where they are, which um, can be different things. So I say to my mother, she loves word find. I say, Ma, let's do Sudoku. Uh, let's do Wordle, right? So when you do different things, you create new neural pathways. 
And so that's important to do. If someone says, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to have no problem. I do, I do crossword every day. Crossword only gives you the, that ability right on that one area. You need to do the multiple areas in your brain, so doing multiple uh, things. And also, not only that, um, think about the way you put your shoes on. Think about the way you, the way you, you, you pull out of your driveway, you take a left. Hey, if you can get to the same location by taking a right, take a right instead. So that's just creating new neural pathways on where you're going. It creates you to start thinking a little more. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, they're out there, and I would also, I'm not a doctor, so I would say to, to um, you know, to work with your doctor on that. You know, currently there are no cures, treatments, or preventions. Currently, is what they're saying. There is hope, right? And so there was a med that, was, that just recently came out that they were thinking was, but then it wasn't as great as they thought. But there is hope out there. And so I think that just like with heart disease, and heart disease actually um, has declined because people know sleep good, eat well, exercise. Well, guess what? That's also going to help you on the brain side too. Make sure you breathe in between everything. So those types of things are important. Yes. Perry Como, she so says. Perry Como, so. Yep, and then pictures. Yeah, yep. pictures and, and music. And then the first thing for her, she brought up seven kids. One of my brothers had a wonderful idea of buying her a baby doll that really yep. looked like a baby. Yep. That she was never alone. Yep. And that's like the for real kitty, too. That's the nurture nature uh, aspect. So don't be afraid to do that. I remember when I first came into this industry, a family was mortified that their, their mother was carrying a baby around. And I'm like, yeah, be open-minded to the fact that she's finding that she belongs, like there's a, there's a love. And so you can buy the $200 baby. That's okay. Realistic $200 baby. That's a, the only thing I'm going to say to you is that I have found great success with a baby at Walmart from, for $888. And the biggest thing that you have to pay attention to is the eyes have to open, have to close. Don't get a baby with their eyes constantly closed. I had an experience with somebody who had a SIDS child, and they had a catastrophic reaction because that baby looked like it was a SIDS baby every time she had seen it. So again, eyes open, eyes closed, 888, Walmart, they have the, man, the boy and the girl, uh, and that definitely works. So thank you for that. And vascular dementia is the second leasing, leading cause of, of memory loss. Right. But anyway, um, one time she asked me what I'm getting for the fiddlers back because it, this still bothers me. Um, I got out of the shower one day and my mother said to me, um, Where's dad? Yeah. I found him dead by the And I said, so he, he left. She said, He left a, uh, an hour ago and he's not back. So I said, Well, he said Home Depot. Home Depot. Well, that's why it's important. So as someone progresses in the disease, when they're newly diagnosed and as they progress, if they catch you in a fib, that's not good. It, it de definitely, and, and so thank you for sharing that with me because fiblets are good when they're good, but they're bad when they're bad. <laughs> so it, when you, a fiblet works, who do you tell? Everyone, you tell all the caregivers. When a fiblet doesn't work, who do you tell? Everyone, right? And so that through that process, when somebody's early on in the disease process, you definitely can run into that. And that's when I say to them, I run myself over with a bus and say, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what else to say, right? And so acknowledge that, talk to them about it, because there are moments, right, that if you've read the notebook, there are periods of lucidity. So you'll know your loved one best but there are times, I had a gentleman who knew his wife had died 11 years ago and he looked at me and said, where's my wife the, the, the one day? 
And I said, you know what, it's 8 o'clock. She said, um, I, I bet you went to school. I knew it was under his iceberg. I knew that his wife was a school teacher. And so right away I told the nurse. We pulled a urine to see if there was anything going on. There wasn't. So he was in that natural decline. But yeah, it, I call this the snowflake disease, right? Everyone's different. And as you had mentioned with um, vascular, Alzheimer's and many other diseases that create memory loss are like this. They have a gradual decline. Vascular is not. Vascular is more like a staircase. And so it can, it, things can happen very differently. They can wake up and, you know, with a, because they had a little stroke or a TIA, they may be incontinent. They, may be, they might have, um, well, like I had mentioned, aphasia where they have a challenge with formulating language. Yes. That's a great experience. In a more way, but I had the time to process that. That's great. Yes? I just wanted to ask, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? That's a great question. And so she asked, what's the, question, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So if you think about it, I'm going to go back to COVID. What's one of the symptoms of COVID? Sniffles. Sniffles, right? So sniffles is, is, a, is a symptom of COVID. And so, is it the only, if you get the sniffles, does that mean you have COVID? No, no it's only a symptom, right? So, a symptom of COVID is sniffles, but you can have sniffles when you have a cold. You can have sniffles when you have allergies, right? So, there's other reasons why you can have sniffles. Dementia is a symptom. It is a symptom of a disease. Alzheimer's is the top leading disease, right? So, typically, I think they're looking at about 80 percent of all dementias are from the Alzheimer's type. There's familial Alzheimer's, which is from still Alice, and then there's sporadic Alzheimer's, which people will get uh, beyond their 80s usually. Earlier is more familial. They say that that's um, um, familial is a, a younger, um, can, can be younger. So familial and, 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 um, and sporadic are two forms of Alzheimer's. Now there's also vascular. So that's vascular strokes. Those are diseases that can cause dementia. So dementia is a symptom in the Alzheimer's. There's over 100 different diseases that can cause dementia. AIDS can cause dementia. There's frontal lobe, FTD, frontal lobe dementia. Yep. Yeah, so years ago it used to be, you know, through an autopsy they could verify 100% whether or not someone had that, but today with the advances in medicine, PET scans and the like can determine um, uh, these scans with color d differentiations in the brain will identify where, so frontal lobe and the like. So they can absolutely determine a diagnosis of some form of memory loss with these scans now. Great questions. About uh, one or two more questions. And um, before you leave, uh, Avita has provided uh, refreshments. Uh, it's in the back. And this is a wonderful gift that you've given us with these books. Thank you so much. And thank you, Avita. Thank you. Thank you. I was taking notes, and I saw a couple other people taking notes. If we knew the book was coming, we would have been focusing more. So it might be a good idea if you're passing out the books to let us know. Absolutely. Thank, thank you both. For oh, you're welcome. The presentation. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. So the question is, you know, what if you have a friend and you see that they're having some challenges? You see them slipping, right, cognitively. So I, I, I think that Kathy alluded to this before. Um, it's important to note that there are dementias, but there's also delirium. And so you guys can work together to identify, hey, listen, there's something out there called a UTI or there's something out there called delirium that can cause confusion that is reversible. So there's dementia and then there's delirium. Delirium is very different than dementia. Delirium is reversible. So again, that's a nice in that if somebody's having a challenge that you might talk about, listen, I went to a class and they were talking about delirium. And delirium is caused by, um, it could be a medication interaction, it can be a urinary tract infection, it can be fever, right? So there are things that can cause that where you might have that conversation and ask them, you know, hey, listen, that can be fixed. They might say, I know I'm a little forgetful. You can say, you know what, that might be able to be fixed if it's a delirium. Why don't I go with you? Let's go check it out. And if you have friends and they have children, I mean, I, you know, my, my parents have friends and they all have my cell phone number, they all connect with me uh, because I want to know, right? I want to be able to support. If I, I mean, look at them, I work, right? So I don't see them all the time, even though they live in my house. I might have somebody I'd love if somebody came to me and said, hey, I want you to know I had a, you know, a tough time with transferring dad today or whatever it was. Um, that's really important for me to know. So great question. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, they're tough questions. They're tough. I mean, they're, again, this, this journey is not easy. So um, I can't thank you enough for being caregivers, friends, and neighbors of people that need your support and, and, uh, and family. And uh, I was honored to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you.